Please rise. Please remove your headgear. Chaplain Reggie Gates will offer prayer. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful evening. We thank you for our post, our members, and the National Commander coming to Vermont to see our post. We thank you for our veterans. We thank you for the auxiliary, the writers, the sons. We thank you for everything you do for each and every one of us every day. And we can never thank you enough, dear Lord. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please join me as we recite the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Recover and please be seated. Henry and Leanne, could you come forward, please? Those who have served and those currently serving in the uniform services of the United States are ever, ever mindful that the sweetness of enduring peace has always been tainted by the bitterness of personal sacrifice. We are compelled to never forget that while we enjoy our daily pleasures, there are others who have endured and may still be enduring the agonies of pain, deprivation, and imprisonment. Before we begin our activities, we will pause to recognize our POWs and MIAs. We call your attention to this small table, which occupies a place of dignity and honor. It is set for one, symbolizing the fact that members of our armed forces are missing from our ranks. They are referred to as POWs and MIAs. We call them comrades. They are unable to be with their loved ones and families, so we join together to pay humble tribute to them and to bear witness to their continued absence. The table is small, symbolizing the frailty of one prisoner, alone against his or her suppressors. The tablecloth is white, symbolic of the purity of their intentions to respond to their country's call to arms. The single rose in the vase signifies the blood that they may have shed in sacrifice to ensure the freedom of our beloved United States of America. This rose also reminds us of the family and friends of our missing comrades who keep faith while awaiting their return. The red ribbon on the vase represents an unyielding determination for a proper accounting of our comrades who are not among us. A slice of lemon on the plate reminds us of their bitter fate. The salt sprinkled on the plate reminds us of the countless tears, countless fallen tears of families as they wait. The glass is inverted. They cannot coast, toast with us at this time. The chair is empty. They are not here. The candle is reminiscent of the light of hope, which lives in our hearts to illuminate their way home, away from their captors to the open arms of a grateful nation. The American flag reminds us that many of them may never return and have paid the supreme sacrifice to ensure our freedom. Let us pray to the supreme commander that all of our comrades will soon be back within our ranks. Let us remember and never forget their sacrifice. May God forever watch over them and protect them and their families. Thank you. Thank you, Henry. Thank you, Leon.
All right, before we do uh, our introductions tonight, uh, we have a couple of ceremonies we'd like to conduct. First, I'd like to invite Department of Vermont Auxiliary and Unit 7 Vice President Karina Colson to come forward. She will be doing a presentation of the military children's table. Karina? Thank you, George. Um, so we'll begin today with a ceremony to honor our military children. Our United States military members answer the call to service every day as they defend freedom around the world. That service often comes at a great personal sacrifice, not only for the service member, but also for their family and their children. When an Air Force officer was asked what he needed in Iraq, he said, please do not send cookies, care packages, or socks. Please just take care of our children. Our country has always supported its military in times of war through community efforts. We have a great capacity to care for them on the home front. Now is the time for a new victory garden. In this garden, we can tend to the needs of the military child. Today, we would like to present you with the military children's table setting inspired by the POW MIA ceremony to honor the sacrifices and contributions of our military children. First, we have Madison, who comes with the potted flowering plant, symbolizing that they may flower and flourish wherever they are planted. She also carried the hand spade, which recognizes that they may be transplanted to a new location at any place in the world at a moment's notice, where they will become fully immersed in the culture, making new friends and acclimating themselves to a new school. Next, we have Jen, who carries the birthday hat and unlit candles. And Sarah, who has a baseball glove and a ball. And Paige comes with ballet slippers, representing the fact that sometimes special occasions are missed by one or both parents while they are serving their country. The family photo that Karina is putting up now depicts a child or children with their uniform parent. It represents the foundation of our country's strength. The photo we are using is that of one of our post members, Ivan Menard, who is a sergeant in the Army National Guard. It's a picture of him with his wife, Brenda, who is also um, here, and their young daughter, Lindsay, after a deployment uh, to uh, the Middle East. I have another picture that I like to bring, too, of a happier time, um, and it's one of Ivan with his son, Andrew. Um, this was taken at the Tristan Southworth Memorial um, softball game, uh, something that Ivan and uh, his, uh, his other officers started for Tristan Southworth, who is a, um, who was a soldier from Hazen Union High School that was uh, killed in action. So um, Ivan and Brenda, would you like to stand to be recognized? enters with an American flag, showing that families united in their commitment to national service and willing to make any sacrifices, both at home and abroad, to ensure that our flag flies free. Amen. Thank you, Thank you Karina and Jen, for that very moving presentation. Two of the pillars the American Legion was founded upon are Americanism and children and youth. Recently, here in our community, we had several area youth who questioned why the Pledge of Allegiance was not being recited in their middle and high schools. Through their efforts and the backing of many community and Legion family members, the Pledge is once again part of the morning routine at Hazen Union School. At this point, 
I'd like to ask Department of Vermont Southern Area Commander Catherine Tester to come forward along with Jen Tedesco, Aaron Moeller, and Jordan Ewan for an award presentation. If, if the youngsters can come right up in front here. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Dave, can you help me with this? Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? My name is Catherine Tester, and I'm the Americanism Chairman for the Department of Vermont. It gives me great pleasure today to recognize three young adults from Hazen High School. As veterans, there is nothing we take more pride in and have more respect for than our symbol of freedom, the American flag and pledging allegiance to it. The Pledge of Allegiance of the United States is an ex expression of allegiance to the flag of the United States and the Republic of the United States. At Hazen High School, senior Jennifer Tedesco <laughs> asked principal, the principal a simple question. Why aren't we saying the pledge? Is this on? Okay. Little did she know that this simple question would prompt the principal to launch a civil discourse study. Groups of students researched the history and meaning of the pledge, its role in our society, and the different perspectives that people have. The group also discussed a way to come up with a proposal on how to integrate the pledge into the school day. There, has been an o there was an open meeting with the community, student council, staff, facu staff and faculty, and students to discuss the group's findings, where Jennifer insisted the pledge be said prior to the start of this meeting. On Friday morning, following the committee me com community meeting, the principal used the public address system to thank students and staff for their participation in the meeting the night before. This was followed by Wildcat Wake Up, the morning announcement show hosted this day by Aaron Mueller and Jordan Ewan. After delivering the morning announcements, Aaron and Jordan took it upon themselves to say over the PA system, please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, and then recited the pledge. The following week, the students themselves made the decision to bring the pledge back to Hazen High School. Jennifer, Aaron, and Jordan demonstrated the patriotic behavior the American Legion is dedicated to perpetuate. Reading and listening to what these young adults did with leading the charge to bring back the pledge in their high school has left me hopeful for the future of young Americans that will one day lead this country. In recognition of the patriotism showed by Jennifer, Aaron, and Jordan, the American Legion is proud to present a certificate and medal of accommodation, an American Legion 100 centennial coin, the National Commander coin, and a Pledge of Allegiance wooden sign signed by our National Commander. We also have a, a coin, uh, 2019 American Legion 100th Anniversary commemorative, commemorative coin um, but from the auxiliary. So if we can have a round of applause for these young students. Why don't you go around and I'll hand everything to you. If you want to go around, I'll hand them all to you. Sorry. Um, hang on, I'm going to have the commander give a tour. Thank you. This is for Aaron. To have one last round of applause for them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Commander. All right, moving along. So back in the fall, last fall, um, Commander Dave Woodward approached us here at Post 7 uh, when he learned that Commander Reistad would be visiting our, our great state. 
And he asked then if we would like to host this dinner. Um, we immediately responded with an enthusiastic yes, although I'll admit I was a little nervous. Um, this is a big deal. I don't really know when the last time a national commander was here in Vermont, uh, much less here at Post 7. Um, but we felt it would be an opportunity for uh, all of us, our Legion family here in Vermont, and our community members to meet, listen, and talk with Commander Reistad about the issues facing all of us. So at this point, um, I just want to make a few introductions of our Post 7 uh, officers. Uh, first, uh, our member at large here at Post 7, Gary Smith. Our first vice commander, Willie McAllister. Our chaplain, Reggie Gates. Or Reverend Reg, as he's affectionately known by all of us. Uh, our adjutant and our Post 7 Gateway Riders Director, Mark Cloutier. Our post service officer, Lou Furry. And our post sergeant at arms, Ivan Menard. We also have with us here, um, and a couple of them were already introduced, but I'll, I'll note them again. We have three of our past post seven commanders here. Bert Bellavance. Gary Smith, and Lou Furry. All right, at this point, I'd like to introduce uh, Squadron 7 Sons Commander Henry Cleveland. Henry? And Mark has the microphone for you, Henry. I got a pretty good voice anyways, but we'll take it. So um, all I want to say for sure is uh, I want to thank the command, National Commander for coming to our, our squadron and our post and our American Legion family here. And I'd like to have all members of the squadron number seven please stand to be recognized that are here. I know some of them are out in the kitchen. Would you please stand? And to make things speed up, that's all we're going to say for now. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Henry. Uh, next, uh, our Auxiliary Unit 7 President, Leanne Lee. To echo what Henry said, yes. what Henry yep. said um, thank you so much for coming, and what a gentleman. He held the door for us as we came back in after <laughs> flat tire outside. Um, thank you to everybody who is helping out. One of our officers, um, our chaplain, is the one leading the charge in the kitchen right now, Audria, Henry's lovely wife. We have several members. We have some past presidents. Linda May Clow is here, and Orice Ainsworth. Um, uh, we're, well, no, I know Karina, uh, Karina and um, give me a second, uh, uh, Lorraine Huzzy, I think, is here. Lorraine Huzzy. If I forgot anybody, I am very sorry. And um, yes, Karina is, was the president last year, and she's the vice president this year. And thank you again. Thank you, Leanne. And next, I'd like to introduce Department of Vermont Commander Dave Woodard. Yeah, you do work. <laughs> uh, thanks for being the mic, <laughs> Mark. <laughs> I guess I don't talk that loud, so maybe George thought I needed two of them. Uh, uh, I will introduce the officers, the department officers that I see around. Um, uh, we have our NEC woman, Marty Lemna. Our alternate NEC backwoods uh, <laughs> predator. <laughs> Senior Vice Commander around the rows. We have our department adjutant. Uh, stand up, Keith. <laughs> Keith Harlan. 
Department, Sergeant at Arms, Fred Stebbins. Northern Area Commander and didn't have a flat tire this morning, Bill Schmidt. <laughs> but I'm wondering because we had a flat tire over here somewhere. <laughs> um, Southern Area Commander, Kathy Tester. Also our Americanism Chairman. Uh, District 2 Commander, Mark Claudier. Mark. Dave Perrin, Caledonia County Commander. I got a riders director here, Lou Fury. Oh, where's Ray? Right behind the post. All oh, right, our department historian, Ray St. John. I think that's pretty much it for department officers. Give the mic back to you. You want both of them, or no? I'll just oh, take it. Okay. I'll just take one. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. Melody. 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 Oh, department secretary. Oh my God. Oh, you're in trouble. <laughs> you're, in, you're in trouble. You're in trouble. I can't remember her name. <laughs> oh, oh, <boy. laughs> I, I apologize for that, Melody. And I will also introduce Sherry, who is my better half and keeps me out of trouble. And she didn't remind me about Melody, and that's why I forgot. <laughs> all, right, all right. Thank you, Dave. Okay, we have a, a few more uh, distinguished guests that I'd like to recognize. Um, first, we have... Lieutenant Walter Smith, Commander, Vermont State Police, Derby Barracks, and U.S. Army veteran as well. Thanks for coming, Walt. Dale Manning, member of the Vermont Capitol Pol Police Department, and U.S. Army veteran. And Commander, knowing you're a, you're a retired and current LEO, we wanted to uh, get some of these guys here. Uh, and we also have uh, John DeGroselier, U.S. Army Reserve Ambassador for Vermont. <laughs> and last but certainly not least, uh, this is a real pleasure to introduce these next three uh, distinguished guests because they really are distinguished. Um, these three men are members of our nation's greatest generation. As we all know, they, these guys are World War II veterans. We don't have many left. And it's, it's really a pleasure to see them here this evening. Uh, first, we have Ken Brown, a member here at Post 7. Albert Lacasse, Post 7. <laughs> and from over in Morrisville at Post 33, Dick Abair. I think okay. you're getting there. I'm not worried about it. We did. We did. Yes. What's that? We're good, we're good. It's coming, it's coming. Okay, well, I thought you were going to do that, Leanne. All right. I can stand up and speak loud. We won't give you a microphone. <laughs> I, I, oh, I, I apologize. I didn't realize I was the one doing it. Our state president is Karen DeGrinia. District 2 President is Gail Bonnell. Yeah, and I, I will. Henry, you want to go ahead? One more. We have our uh, detachment commander, Steve Ingham. Will you please stand? <laughs> Sir, on behalf of the detachment of Vermont, it is a pleasure to be here to celebrate the 100th anniversary, to have our national commander here, to be here with distinguished gentlemen. My father was a World War II vet, that's how I gained my eligibility, and thank you, thank you so much, gentlemen. I'd like all detachment of Vermont officers to please stand and be recognized. 
Thank you guys for your great team. Thank you, Steve. And we also have our National Executive Committee. <laughs> Thanks for being here, John. Okay. Um, probably all hungry, huh? Yeah. We'll, we'll wait to introduce the national commander after the meal. He gets, he gets the big introduction. Uh, right now, I'm going to pass it over to Chaplain Reggie, and he is going to bless our food, and then we'll get eating. You need this, Reg? Oh, I don't know. Can you hear me in the back? <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> Heavenly Father, as we sat here tonight to enjoy this wonderful meal, we must also remember all the veterans that have lost their lives and will not be sitting here. This last year we lost two past commanders and a whole bunch of other members. But we know, dear Lord, where they're sitting tonight. Your good book says that you will prepare a place for us and then you will come get us. As we all, as you all, as you come back to take us all one by one to sit at your table would be a grateful thing. But tonight, we want to thank you for this wonderful meal we're about to receive here. We ask you to bless this food. Bless this food to our mind, body, as you must bless our soul. Thank you, dear Lord, for everything, and we ask you to bless the hands and prepare it. So in Jesus Christ's name, we thank you again. Amen. Amen. At this point, I'd like to introduce our national commander, who we're here to honor, Brett Reistad. He was elected as our commander in August of 2018 at the 100th National Convention. He's a resident of Manassas, Virginia, and a life member and past commander of Post 270 in McLean, Virginia. And he has been a Legion member since 1981. He retired as a lieutenant from the Fairfax County, Virginia Police Department. Then he started a second career as a services coordinator for the Regional Organized Crime Information Center, a congressionally funded law enforcement enforcement investigative assistance program of the U.S. Department of Justice. He holds a Bachelor of Science degree in criminal justice from Bluefield College in Virginia. Commander Reistad is a Vietnam-era veteran of the U.S. Army. He served as an infantryman in the Presidential Salute Battery of the 3rd U.S. Infantry Regiment, the Old Guard. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Brett P. Reistad, National Commander, American Legion. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good evening. First of all, I just I, I want to tell you what a pleasure it is to be here at Post 7 this evening, uh, to be in the Department of Vermont and uh, experiencing this beautiful weather, <laughs> which I'm sure you're used to this. Um, and of course, we are in Virginia during the winter. Uh, but I came from D.C. I spent the last two days in D.C. and day before yesterday it was up to 81 degrees. Ah. So you can imagine the uh, you can imagine the shock getting off the airplane here and uh, and, and and seeing the weather that I'm going to be dealing with for the next couple of days. But uh, hey, it's New England. Uh, I spent part of my life being raised in Connecticut, so I'm not. Uh, uh, it's not foreign to me at all. Um, I had the, uh, the, the pleasure of serving this organization as national commander and I'm honored to do so since August 30th of this year at our national convention. So I'm already eight months into my tenure. And uh, with this visit to Vermont, it is our, when I say our, I mean uh, my aide Kenny and I. Kenny's probably wandering around here, okay, with the camera. Uh, <laughs> We, we've, we've, been, uh, we've been traveling together, and this is our 35th department visit. Uh, and we're going to hope by the end of the year to have visited 55. So that's 50, 50 states. 
That's 50 states and five foreign territories. Uh, we've had the, the, the pleasure of visiting the Far East, which has uh, taken us to South Korea, Okinawa, Taiwan, and uh, Japan. And uh, we'll be going to uh, Europe in June, uh, visiting Germany, Belgium, and France. And it will be our honor to be present during the 75th anniversary of the D-Day landings in Normandy, which uh, proves it is supposed to be a, uh, a tremendously well-attended affair this year. So I'm looking forward to going to Normandy this year and uh, honoring those that uh, stormed the beaches on June 6th of 1944 and uh, led to the conclusion of uh, the war in Europe. And uh, it's great to be in the company of some of our World War II veterans here tonight. One of, the, uh, one of the honors that I have as I travel around the country is to talk about our centennial. And I understand uh, from a conversation here just a moment or so ago that uh, you just celebrated your 100th anniversary uh, by having a dinner a week ago, is that correct? Yes, and that uh, I guess some of the uh, some of the highlights of the last 100 years were mentioned, and uh, uh, I'm going to reinforce those tonight. <laughs> so, if you've heard them before, you might hear some new things tonight. But you know, I I spent 13 years of my American Legion experience as a department historian. Um, for the Department of Virginia and uh, had a lot of time on my hands to learn about the history of the American Legion, uh, having no idea then how it would serve me today. But our organization, going back over the last 100 years, has done a great many things. Um, I'm sure I'm just going to go over the highlights with you, some of the things that I think are important. Uh, and, and this is at the national level. This doesn't even speak to the things that you've done locally or, or at the state level, which I'm sure are, are, are even more than this. But what I want to do is just kind of give you a, a synopsis of some of the things that have occurred and maybe a little background information on some of them. And then I'll follow it up with uh, talking to you about some of the topical um, um, things that are going on right now in a national organization that I think you'd like to know about. So first, you know, our World War II, or World War II, World War I veterans, uh, when they came home after, uh, after the, uh, the first uh, um, caucus in Paris, France in uh, uh, 1919, in fact, in March from the seven, uh, 15th to the 17th, 1919, had the second caucus in St. Louis, Missouri um, uh, from the 8th to the 10th of May. Of 1919, and it's at that point that Legion posts around the country started springing up, and we had our first national convention, which coincided with the first anniversary of the World War One armistice in November of 1919. And at that time, we already had about 850,000 Legionnaires in this organization. But when they came back, there were two things that our Legionnaires were, were focused on primarily. One of them uh, was promoting Americanism across the United States, and the second was trying to build an infrastructure or work with Congress to build an infrastructure to take care of their own fellow service members who came home wounded and sick and did not have enough hospital space available for them to convalesce. So. They were opening up buildings that never were intended to be hospitals in order to place some of those that returned that needed, uh, needed hospitalization. So our Legionnaires worked very closely with members of Congress to try to build that infrastructure. So this included two things. This included pulling together three disparate agencies of the federal government that were intended to provide resources to our returning service members, none of them working particularly effectively. I think it dealt with insurance, health care, and then uh, uh, providing uh, vocational training to those that came back. And as a result of the Legion's intervention with Congress, uh, those three agencies were, were pulled together into one. And the federal government began building hospitals around the country. And 
In the 1920s, the organization that was doing that was given a name, the United States Veterans Bureau. Today, that organization is the Department of Veterans Affairs. So I bring that to your attention because we as Legionnaires are stakeholders in the Department of Veterans Affairs. And if they do a great job, we're the first to stand in line to applaud them. And if they stray off course, we're going to be the first in line to give them a course correction. But we support the Department of Veterans Affairs, and we do not support privatization of health care for our veterans. It's great that we have a choice program. It's great that we have a mission act to help in instances where, uh, where they're not able to get timely appointments uh, or the distance is too far for somebody to travel but uh, limiting it to that. The uh, American Legion worked closely with other veteran service organizations and other uh, patriotic organizations to create a document that was later adopted by the federal government known as the United States Flag Code. The American Legion has a history with the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. We had a founder in our organization by the name of Hamilton Fish. Hamilton Fish was a World War I Army officer who was involved in a lot, of the, uh, um, a lot of the work associated with the founding of the American Legion. Uh, so much so that Fish was given the, the honorary title of past national commander, even though he never served as a national commander. Um, we might know him now. We can associate him with our preamble to the Constitution of the American Legion because he was the individual that chaired the committee that authored that, uh, that preamble. Fish went on to become a congressman in the state of New York. And as a legionnaire and as a congressman, Fish was responsible for the legislation that brought the unknown soldier of World War I from France to the United States to Arlington National Cemetery for burial. He was also responsible for the legislation that created the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. So moving ahead about 15 years or so, uh, it was Legion legislators on Capitol Hill that were responsible for the legislation to put uh, full-time sentinels at the tomb 24 hours a day, 365 days of the year. Um, during our 50th anniversary of the American Legion in 1969, uh, our organization gave a gift to the nation, and that gift was outdoor lighting for the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. Uh, the American Legion worked closely still with Congress to um, create veterans committees in both houses. Um, I had the honor about a month or so ago to testify before a joint session of the House and Senate Veterans Affairs Committees during our Washington conference in Washington, D.C. The uh, testimony lasted about two and a half hours. Uh, probably my initial oral testimony was no more than about 15 or 20 minutes. And the rest was questions and answers by members of those committees. Uh, we covered a wide range of topics. The purpose for our testimony every year before them is to give them our uh, legislative priorities for the year. So we had great discussion over a great number of topics that uh, uh, were veterans related. And uh, we also worked with uh, members of Congress early on to create veterans preference uh, for federal hiring. So our veterans, um, if they were honorably discharged, would have uh, five points preference toward federal hiring. And if they were uh, disabled, would have 10 points. And there are quite a number of them that have returned from the recent conflicts that are currently working in our federal government as a result of that. Uh, the American Legion in 1932 created the Sons of the American Legion. And I should mention to the Sons that are here today that I am a dual member, and I have been so for about 30 years, Yay. proudly. But the American Legion created the Sons in 1932 for the purpose of carrying on their legacy when they pass. Of course, our World War I veterans never expected that there'd be another world war to follow. And they fully expected that when they got old uh, and, and too old to continue uh, running this organization, that the American Legion would fold. And therefore, we would have the Sons of the American Legion and the American Legion Auxiliary to carry on the legacy of, of our uh, uh, World War I Legionnaires. 
But, as we know, World War II came, ar came around and filled the ranks of the Legion, and uh, uh, that no longer uh, became a problem. Um, another thing you might want to know, too, is probably the greatest piece of veterans legislation ever was the uh, uh, Servicemen's Readjustment Act in 1944, which we all know is the GI Bill of Rights. Um, the gentleman that was responsible for writing the framework of the GI Bill of Rights was somebody by the name of Harry Comery. And Harry Comery was a past national commander of the American Legion, and Kenny, correct me if I'm wrong, 1936 to 37, is that correct? Okay. He served 1936 to 1937. He was responsible for sitting in a hotel room in the Mayflower Hotel in Washington, D.C., and writing on hotel stationery a draft of the GI Bill of Rights. And a uh, little story, a little backstory about the GI Bill was, you know, we would think today that it's a no-brainer that it would have passed through Congress. But back then, um, there was a debate in a committee of both House and Senate representatives to determine whether this was going to go on the floor of the House and Senate for a vote. And they were tied, um, as many for as there were against. And those that were against were against it because they felt that the GI Bill was going to, to break the Treasury of the United States because of all the benefits that it was going to give the returning service members. And uh, in order to break that tie, we needed to have that one additional vote. And there was one person that could do it for us. It was a congressman by the name of Gibson, who was from uh, Georgia. And Gibson was home convalescing from an illness. And a legion reached out to him, explained the circumstances, said, we need you back in Washington, D.C. to cast this deciding vote. Gibson agreed to do it. And under a police escort in, in, a, in a driving rainstorm, uh, he went to uh, the uh, airport in Jacksonville, Florida. The American Legion sent an aircraft to meet him there and fly him back to Washington, D.C. And he cast the deciding vote that allowed this bill to move forward and get passed by Congress. Um, so, so today, uh, there have been some different manifestations of the GI Bill since, but today's GI Bill is known as the Forever GI Bill. And it's forever for a reason. Those of you that may have had the GI Bill in the past, uh, probably like myself with the Vietnam era GI Bill, you had 10 years to use those benefits before they just went away. So the other benefit besides you know, the, the forever, meaning that there's no longer a 10-year limit, is the fact that the, uh, uh, the forever GI Bill can be conveyed from the beneficiary to an immediate family member. Um, and uh, there are some restrictions with that. Uh, the Legion's not in favor of the restri restrictions that currently exist because they're trying to, uh, I, I think, trying to minimize the cost factor of this. But uh, uh, it's, it's a great uh, ad advance over the old GI Bill. And, uh, so, so the, the neat thing about the Forever GI Bill is that it's named after Harry Comery, who was responsible for the first one and our past national commander. Uh, looking at uh, some other things that the Legion did, uh, when our Vietnam veterans started returning from the war in Vietnam and started experiencing illnesses that were very unusual, uh, that they were tying to their service in Vietnam. Um, it was determined that, or thought at the time, that the uh, defoliant Agent Orange was responsible for it. Um, Congress didn't want to acknowledge that. Uh, the VA didn't want to acknowledge that with doing long, without doing long-term scientific studies. But pressure by the American Legion and by some of our other fellow veteran service organizations um, um, convinced the Department of Veterans Affairs that they needed to provide the necessary health care and, and the, uh, uh, the benefits to those that, uh, that served and were experiencing those illnesses. And you know, even recently we've been dealing with that was something called the Blue Water Navy. Uh, at one time, Congress was providing uh, um, medical um, care and uh, providing uh, benefits to those that served in Vietnam off the shores of Vietnam. Uh, however, they stopped providing those benefits, kind of leaving those people who, uh, without any, any recourse. And uh, it went back to court uh, with a 
court case known as the uh, the Blue Water Navy Act. Uh, it was in 115th Congress. It did not pass in 115th Congress. It went through the House of Representatives unanimously, but it was held up in the Senate by a couple of senators who thought it was their job to stand in between them getting those benefits uh, in order, you know, for for the cost not to be passed on to the federal government. Uh, needless to say, after the 115th Congress, it was reintroduced in the 116th Congress. But here, within about a month or so ago, there was a federal court hearing. It was an appeal hearing by another uh, by another sailor who uh, served in that Blue Water Navy who had uh, health problems that were uh, traced to uh, Agent Orange. And uh, the appeals court ruled in his favor and said not only is that man entitled to benefits uh, and health care treatment by the federal government, but as is everyone else that is experiencing uh, those uh, uh, um, physical ailments that are traceable to Agent Orange. So uh, where we stood with that was that they uh, had an open, uh, uh, open time period for the VA to uh, appeal that ruling. And I learned about two weeks ago that the VA decided that they're not going to do it. So that should stand, and those blue water sailors should finally uh, be getting their, uh, uh, getting their health care and their compensation, although we've probably lost a lot of them over the time that, uh, that they weren't. Uh, the uh, Legion was also the single highest contributor to the uh, Vietnam Veterans Memorial, giving more than a million dollars. And uh, even before the memorial was completed and they needed more money, Legion Post from around the country generously gave to the memorial to ensure its completion. Uh, just a couple of other things I wanted to mention, too. Uh, we were more recently involved in helping to uh, move forward the VA Accountability Act and also the uh, VA Mission Act, uh, both of which are, are now uh, uh, bills that are uh, um, you know, alive and, and, and working uh, to, to try and uh, uh, deal with some of the issues that we've had with, uh, uh, with the VA. Um, now, it takes me to a point where I want to talk about some of the things that uh, you might find uh, of interest. Uh, of course, the first thing I want to talk about is our centennial coins. You're all probably aware of the fact that they're on sale now. These are the coins that we approached Congress about a year ago and asked if they would consider uh, honoring the American Legion Centennial by allowing us to be one of the two organizations for the year that would have commemorative coins minted by the United States Mint. Uh, we, we were able to get that accomplished. The coins were made. There are three coins in the series, a gold coin, a silver coin, and what they call a clad coin, which is a less expensive uh, uh, variation. Uh, they're sold individually and are also sold in, in, in sets of three. The, the, the sets of three, more than half of them are already gone. If you have an interest in buying any of these coins, I would suggest you go to the Legion website at legion.org or go to the United States Mint uh, website at usmint.gov. You can buy them there. Uh, apparently, they're discounted up until about April 15th, and then the uh, cost will go up on them. Uh, but one of the reasons I brought this up is because there is a surcharge that is placed on the sale of each one of these coins that go back to the organization that the coins have been minted for. So in our case, uh, if we sell all these coins, the American Legion stands to earn about $9.5 million toward our programs and toward our charities. And just in case you are interested in the other organization that, uh, uh, that had uh, con commemorative coins minted this year, it was in honor of the Apollo 11's 50-year uh, anniversary of, uh, of Man on the Moon. Uh, another thing that's uh, really big right now is uh, some legislation that we just put forward in both houses of Congress called the Legion Act. Um, there's an acronym for which Legion stands for, but it's long, and I've not been able to, to, to memorize it, so I'm not even going to get into it. But the Legion Act is legislation um, that is asking for Congress to allow the American Legion to, well, first of all, to amend the American Legion's uh, congressional charter to allow the Legion to uh, set their own membership eligibility dates. 
which would open up, if we, if we were granted this, uh, it would allow us to open up our eligibility for uh, other veterans that served outside of the wartime eras. And taking this a step further, the original intent of the, uh, the resolutions that were passed by our National Executive Committee were to provide, uh, to, to honor those that served during those peacetime periods that maybe in, were involved in the uh, Cold War uh, and, and other, um, other incidents in which our military was involved uh, during the supposed peacetime eras. So what they were looking at is uh, from December 7, 1941 to present day to open that whole period up as a wartime era instead of all those individual wartime eras that current, currently exist. Uh, and, and the purpose behind that too is to honor those others for their service. You probably have had the experience I have where they've come up to you and they have asked you uh, about membership in the American Legion and you look at the membership application and look at their service dates and they don't qualify and you have to turn them away and say, I'm sorry, you can't be a member of the American Legion. You might be able to qualify as a SONS member or as an auxiliary member. But, you know, many of them walk away and they think they're second class citizens because they can't belong to our organization. And we've been trying to deal with this for the last two or three years. And finally, uh, our judge advocate at the national level was tasked with doing some research and looking at those peacetime periods and trying to determine how many incidents our military was involved in. Uh, I don't remember the number, but it filled up three pages of whereas clauses. And when you count up the number of those that died and those that were injured or wounded uh, in service to our country, uh, that added up to about 1,600 service members. So that's a large number. So that is our intent. Uh, first going forward with the Legion Act and then following it up with a request to Congress to consider opening up the uh, uh, the war eras to one single war era. Another thing that the National Executive Committee did uh, during the fall was to create a new uh, um, charity uh, out of the American Legion Endowment Fund, and this is called the American Legion Veterans and Children Foundation. The purpose of this charity is twofold. It's to provide money to American Legion service officers and to provide money to our temporary financial assistance program. Our service officers, we have about 3,500 around the world for the American Legion more than any other organization. They require certification, recertification. They now require computers, software, uh, connectivity to be able to do the claims. Uh, and when you look at the temporary financial assistance, if you're not familiar with it, uh, this is the program of the American Legion that if you're an active duty military member or you're a legionnaire and you have uh, dependent children, and you're in a financial spot and just need to get through that spot, um, you can apply for a grant from the American Legion's Temporary Financial Assistance Program. And we can give you anywhere from $500 to $1,500 to help you take care of those kids. So the focus is on the kids. It's on the roof over their head, the clothing, the food, the medical care, <clears throat> and just helping the parents through a, a financial hardship period in, in order to make sure that the kids have everything that they need. Um, so um, just recently, when the federal government had its shutdown, and we realized that the Coast Guard went without a paycheck and were very possibly going to go without a second paycheck. The American Legion offered to the Coast Guard uh, a streamlined application process. Uh, we focused on the pay grades of E1 to E5, those that are most likely to be living from paycheck to paycheck, and uh, offered them um, our temporary financial assistance grants. And we had, when we started the year, $280,000 budgeted for that program. And that would have been enough money to cover all of the requests that we would normally get. But with the Coast Guard, that changed. We ended up, when all was said and done, helping about 2,000 Coast Guard families, uh, roughly about 3,200 children. And of that $280,000, spent more than a million dollars helping them out. So the 
purpose now of the Veterans and Children Foundation, uh, well, the focus of it now is to try to raise money to make up for that money that we um, that we provided to our Coast Guard folks. And I got to tell you, they appreciated everything we did. We heard it from them. We heard it from their command, uh, both in Washington, well, in Washington D.C. from uh, uh, one of their top admirals, and then also from their their senior enlisted chief who came and spoke to us at our Washington conference and as much as much as said to us that he is now a, a great advocate of the American Legion and will be promoting our organization and membership in our organization. So so that's great to hear. I want to thank you for that. Plus, I want to thank our local posts, including yourselves. If you have a Coast Guard station here, uh, most of our Coast Guard stations were approached by local legionnaires who provided them with gift cards, food, uh, baby supplies, uh, uh, animal food, uh, all sorts of things that they might need to help uh, tide them over. And uh, um, that wasn't lost on them. Uh, I can't tell you how, how much they have conveyed to us their appreciation for that. Uh, one other thing I want to talk about really quickly is the, uh, um, the incentives for membership this year. We're maybe, at least for me, five months toward the end of our membership year, uh, which will be our, our national convention. Our departments end, end up ending their years sooner than that. Um, we had uh, some challenges this year with membership. We're probably 70 to 80,000 members short of where we were this time last year. It started the year like that. It's probably going to end the year like that. But we've come up with some financial incentives for both the departments and the posts. And we initiated what we call the Buddy Check Program. And the Buddy Check Program was targeted for the Legion Birthday Week or thereabouts. And the whole purpose of that was not to call and ask money, but to have direct contact with our members, all of our members of our posts, by telephone or or in person, just to make sure that they're okay, to check and see if there's anything that we can do for them, and just to let them know that our organization is a better and a stronger organization with their continued membership. And with that, hopefully, a lot of them that will decide that they that would decide that they don't want to be a member anymore might reconsider, and even think next year uh, they'll think back on the fact that they were contacted by their post and how much it meant to them to hear from somebody. So we're going to hopefully continue this on an annual basis and see where it goes. So um, with that, I pretty much. Uh, told you everything that I need to tell you. Well, I didn't, because Kenny is reminding me that we have some uh, some uh, uh, official portraits, courtesy of National Headquarters. Uh, we gave out a bunch of them today at lunchtime, so I don't, uh, you know, it may be redundant for some of you that asked, but we've got these for the posts, so hopefully we'll have enough for the posts. And uh, I'll be happy to sign them and let you bring them back. Um, but with that, I just want to take this opportunity to thank you again for your hospitality, for the great food that we had here today. Uh, the, the great company, uh, the camaraderie. Um, I want to also take this opportunity to thank those of you that served our military, served our country. I want to thank you for your service to our country. Uh, I want to uh, also take this opportunity to thank those of you in here uh, for uh, all you have done uh, in service to our veterans, to our communities, to our children and youth through your continued membership in the American Legion family. So with that, uh, may, may God bless you, may God bless the American Legion, and may God bless the United States of America. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Commander. Okay, uh, at this point, um, I would like to ask uh, SAL Commander Henry Cleveland, Auxiliary President Leanne Lee, uh, and Legion Riders Chapter Mark Cloutier to come forward. Uh, we have some gifts that we'd like to offer you, Commander. Yep. And as we do this, if there's anybody else, any other uh, posts or individuals that have any other gifts that they would like to present to Commander Reistad, uh, please uh, get ready. And as soon as we do this, you'll come forward with yours. 
And don't worry, uh, you don't need a big suitcase. We will uh, get an address from you and we'll, uh, we'll ship this stuff to you so you don't have to carry it back home. All right, we got a gift basket with uh, quite a few things in it. We've got in the box, there's a couple of bottles from Bar Hill. It's a local distillery here in Hardwick. We've got a bottle, a uh, half gallon of pure Vermont maple syrup, uh, compliments of our vice commander, Willie McAllister. Another small bottle of syrup, some Vermont pancake mix, a couple of shot glasses from our post. It says, Cheers. there you go. <laughs> you got something to put in them, too. Uh, Legion Riders coin, uh, an American Legion Post 7 license plate. And from Cabot, which is a local uh, creamery nearby, uh, some Cabot cheese, some of the best cheese in the United States. If you've, if you've ever had it before, you know. If you haven't, you're in for a treat. This is a Vermont maple tree from the state of Vermont Thank department. You. So will this keep? We'll keep it here now. This will keep it. I'll keep it in my house for a while. Though. All right, Dave will, Dave will take care of that for you. And there's a tin, there's a tin with some cheese down underneath the shot glasses, too. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you guys for coming forward. Okay. The uh, Department of Vermont has a, a couple of things to give you as well. I don't have any cheese or maple syrup. Well, I do now, but. Uh, <laughs> um, at our convention, we had some shirts made. So I'm just going to have you. Yeah. We all know what they are, I think, but Brett doesn't. It's our 100th convention. I got one for you and one for your aid. So it's American Legion, Department of Vermont. Well, Come out of your shirt. Two of those. I have uh, yesterday. Was it yesterday? <laughs> it's been a busy few days. <laughs> uh, yesterday, the State House of Representatives, concur we have a concurrent House resolution in Montpelier, Vermont. Yes, I need the glasses. <laughs> it's HCR 103, House Concurrent Resolution Congratulating the American Legion on its centennial, offered by all members of the House. Whereas, on March 15th, 1919, in the aftermath of the 1918 armistice that ended the World War I, a group of American soldiers gathered at the American Officers Club, and then on March 17th, 1919, at the Sir de Paris, for meetings known as the Paris Caucus, at which a new veterans organization tentatively named the American Legion was established. And in May 1919, the deliberations continued at the Sherbert Theater in St. Louis, Missouri caucus where the initial Paris decisions were finalized and whereas on September 16th, 1919, the original American Legion Act charting the organization was federally enacted and whereas on November 1919, at the first American convention held in Minneapolis, Minnesota, the American Legion Auxiliary was officially recognized, enabling women to support that exclusively veteran organization, and whereas on September 1920, American Legion Convention convened in Cleveland, Ohio, the delegates selected the poppy as the organization's official flower, reflecting John McCrae's famous poem in Flanders Fields, and whereas on November 11th, 1921, President Warren G. Harding, World War I Allied generals, and American Legion officials buried the first unknown soldier at a specifically prepared gravesite at the Arlington National Cemetery, and whereas the first American Legion Boys State Convention was conducted in 1935, and in 1938 its companion Girl State was started, and whereas as a result of the American Legion's vigorous advocacy on June 12, 1944, President Franklin Roosevelt signed the Servicemen's Readjustment Act of 1944, more properly known as the GI Bill for Rights, and whereas in more recent decades, the American Legion provided major financial support for the construction of the Vietnam War Memorial in Washington, D.C., and sponsored studies examining post-traumatic stress disorder and the impact of the Agent Orange on Vietnam War veterans, and... 
Whereas in Vermont, Dr. Horatio Nelson Jackson, who was wounded three times as a medical corps member in France, participated in the Paris, in the Paris and St. Louis caucuses, served as a national executive committee man, and organized the American Legion's Department of Vermont and Green Mountain Post 1 in St. Albans, was the first post in the state. Now, therefore, it be resolved by the Senate and House of Representatives that the General Assembly congratulates the American Legion on its centennial and be it further resolved that the Secretary of State be directed to send a copy of the resolution to the American Legion Department of Vermont and to the National Legion headquarters in Indianapolis, Indiana. I'm going to give you this resolution, Brett. It was read right on the floor yesterday. Attested by the Speaker of the House, Mitzi Johnson, David Zuckerman, President of the Senate, and William M. McGall, McGill, I'm sorry, Clerk, House of the Representatives. You know, if you gave me this 15 minutes ago, I'd have saved all of us a lot of time. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's why you're the national commander and I'm the department commander. <laughs> Thank you. I have one other thing. Um, <laughs> considering that you're very instrumental on Team 100, getting this going, I had this kind of as a personal thing from me to you. Uh, the American Legion, 100 years, 1919 to 2019. Um, and on the back, it's inscribed to you uh, from me. That's all I got. <laughs> all right. Thank you, Dave. All right. Who do we have next? Uh, okay. Let's let's go with Dale Manning. Dale Manning uh, is a member of our Capitol Police Department. And Dale, I'll give you the mic, and you can tell us what you have for the commander. Uh, I have a, a Vermont flag, which was flown at the State House, and a certificate attesting to that which reads, this is to certify that this Vermont state flag, identified by the inscription VT 15 March 19 on its border, was flown at the Vermont State Capitol in Montpelier, Vermont on March 15, 2019, on the 100th anniversary of the founding of the American Legion in honor of National Commander Brett P. Reistad, and presented on behalf of American Legion Post Number 7, Hardwick, Vermont, on this 10th day of April, 2019. You're welcome, sir. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Dale. <laughs> Steve. Oh, Commander Reistad. From the behalf of the Detachment of Vermont, as you mentioned, the Sons of the American Legion were created in 1932 to carry on the programs of the American Legion. So it is our pleasure to give you a check for $250 from the Detachment to help your program, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Steve. Gary, come on forward. On behalf of, uh, on behalf of the uh, Legion Riders and Cabot Creamery, who donates a lot to this organization, we'd like to present you with this 100-year 10 with also a cheese that is labeled 100 years for their anniversary. So, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, the Legion Riders would like to present this 100 year 10 from Cabot Creamery, who also um, has a 100 year anniversary this year. And, uh, we just wanted to present that to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. And Commander, uh, after we're all done, we would like to get a picture uh, of you with that. We'd like to send that to Cabot. Um, Linda May, uh, our resident photographer, will do that. All right. Thank you, Gary. Any other gifts to come forward for Commander Eichstad? All right, pretty good take. Okay. Um, all right, there's one one final thing that we want to do. Um, 
when our members in the Legion get to a milestone in their membership, we receive certificates from uh, the national organization. Thank you, Karen. And uh, just before uh, we plan this event, we got one for one of our members. Uh, so at this point, I'd like to call, uh, well, before I call him forward, I just want to note that it was special that you were going to be here when we received this because uh, Commander Reichstad signs these certificates for our members. So um, this is pretty special. We normally present them either at our birthday supper or at one of our uh, regular monthly meetings, but because you were going to be here, uh, it was a great opportunity. So at this point, uh, I'd like to call forward uh, Ken Blair. Ken, come on forward. Yeah, yeah. I'll go around a little bit. Yeah. We'll meet you right up front, Ken. We're going to come around here. Follow, follow the commander right up here. Right up front, Ken. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so this certificate reads, Certificate of Continuous Membership, issued in grateful appreciation for faithful and dedicated, dedicated allegiance to the ideals of the American Legion. Let it be known that Kenneth E. Blair, a longtime and dedicated member of American Legion Post 7, Department of Vermont, has been certified to have been a member in good standing continuously for 50 years. And be it further known that such record of consistent loyalty to the American Legion merits the honor of being cited as an outstanding contributor to the programs of the American Legion. In witness thereof, this testimonial of personal gratitude is given under the hand of the National Commander and duly attested by the National Adjutant this 15th day of March, 2019. All right, thank you, Ken. Thank you. Thank you, <laughs> thank you Commander. All right. I think we're good. Let me just grab my program. We can probably finish out right out here. Let's see. <laughs> All right, we're doing good. We're doing good. Okay. So, uh, I guess right here I'm going to say thank you all for coming tonight, and certainly, Commander, thank you for coming to our post. It was our pleasure to. Thank you for honoring me. Absolutely. What? Oh boy, Bert wants to talk. Should I give him the mic? Okay, here you go, Bert. My name is Albert Bellavance. A lot of you people know me. I'm a, I've been here 67 years, and I'm a, I'm a Korean vet. I've been up and down the line, I've been commander, and you name it, and I've been there. And I want to thank George here for all he done as commander. Thank you. My pleasure, Bert. Thank you. Thank you, Bert. All right. Uh, lastly, I want to thank uh, our planning committee. Uh, when we learned you were coming, this is a big event for us. We wanted to do it right. So um, thank you. So we put together a committee chaired by Henry Cleveland, and it included Mark Cloutier, Karina Colson, and Leanne Lee. Thank you for an excellent job. Well done. Thank you. And now, it's time for Chaplain Reggie. Here you go, Reggie.
Almighty God, as we stand here with bowed heads, we thank you so much for this wonderful meal that we just enjoyed. We ask you for safe travel to all our veterans, especially our national commander and his aide. They, they came the farthest to be at our post. We ask us, dear Lord, that we never forget our POWs and MIA still unaccounted for from all wars and conflicts. And we tell you, ask you, dear Lord, that we never forget our veterans here, the young people serving today, that make America what it is and keep America free. We thank you for everything you do for all of us, and we God bless America. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Chaplain. That concludes our dinner program. Thank you all again for coming, and salute the flag.